good day, and welcome to the premiere episode of Diversity Speaks, True Talk with Terry. I'm Terry Howard, Associate Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Herzing University. At Herzing, we believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion are a living, breathing part of who we are and what we do. So we've created this series in part because we wanted to create a forum for civil discourse. We won't always agree, but let's speak our truths in a way that we can listen, learn, and as a result, grow. Also, there are a lot of questions out there around topics related to diversity and inclusion. We hope that we can shed some light on some of these topics and leave you with something to think about. True Talk is about taking the time to really understand everyone. So let's get talking and speak our truths. Today's topic is cultural competence in healthcare. I can remember on a work trip once to Pennsylvania, I was struck with a bout of vertigo. If you've never had it, you don't want it. And if you've had it, you know what I'm talking about. After the training class I was facilitating was over, I decided to go to an urgent care facility. I walked in, went to the registration desk, and asked if I could see a doctor. The woman behind the desk looked at me and said nothing more than, insurance card, please. My head was pounding and the room was spinning. I said, I'm sorry, I don't have my card. I've been traveling for work and didn't bring it with me. I just really need to see a doctor. She almost seemed disgusted. She grunted and said, well, do you at least have an ID? I gave her the ID. Already in agony, I took a seat and waited for my name to be called. As I sat with my head in my hands, another woman approached the desk in need of medical attention. She was neither asked for insurance or identification. She was simply provided a clipboard and was told to complete the information, not to mention with a please and thank you. Turns out I had an inner ear infection, and the doctor I saw was knowledgeable, nice, and gave me what I needed to feel better. My introduction to that healthcare facility, though, made me feel like if I had not been in such pain, I would have simply walked away. It wasn't just what she said, but how she said it that made the difference. And that was unwelcome. This is my truth. So what is cultural competence? Well, it can be defined as the ability of providers and organizations to effectively deliver healthcare services that meet the social, cultural, and linguistic needs of patients. Okay, so what does that mean? It means, as my mother used to say, different strokes for different folks. This definition is not yet a universally accepted one. Here's what we know from the literature and research. There is a lack of conceptual clarity around cultural competence that persists not only in practice, but among researchers as well. Cultural competence is defined, conceptualized, and operationalized in many different ways. And this variance leads to disagreement around what training might be needed, for providers to attain cultural competence, and how systems may need to change as well. Often the term cultural competence is applied only to racial and ethnic minority populations. And this narrow application actually omits other marginalized groups. And these other groups may be ethnically and racially similar to a provider, but they may be at risk still for stigmatization and discrimination. And they may also have differences in healthcare needs. This results in health disparities. Health and healthcare disparities refer to differences 
between groups that are closely linked with social, economic, and environmental disadvantages. These disparities occur across many dimensions, including race and ethnicity, social economic status, age, location, gender, disability status, and sexual orientation. For example, as of 2018, Hispanics were two and a half more times likely to be uninsured than whites. And individuals with income below the poverty line are four times as likely to lack coverage as those incomes at 400% above the federal poverty level. So maybe we should refer to this as diversity competence as suggested by some in the research. Anyway, you slice it, healthcare providers without the appropriate education and tools may be contributing to the health disparity that exists for many populations. Last month, Herzing launched a virtual training series on diversity in healthcare. And my next guest served as the lead facilitator. Jamise Glass is a recent graduate from Herzing University and currently works in the healthcare industry. Welcome, Jamise, and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. Um, so today we've been talking about cultural competence, and I thought um, just by way of introduction, you can tell us a little bit about what you do um, and how you've had to incorporate learning and actually teaching cultural competency as a way to make sure that people are uh, giving the most effective and appropriate health care? I will say, since I've left Herzing, um, I became an ICU nurse. And the background that I work in is intensive care. And we deal with a lot of very sick people. And the, especially since the wonderful year that we had last year with COVID, it, it did teach you more uh, like it taught me more than what I was used to before COVID families were there so you had to interact with them when they would come visit you had to learn your patient really well and how they like to be treated how they keep their norms at home because we did most of the work because families were not allowed to come visit so you really had to hone in on many of the skills you do gain from school um, and how to properly care for the individuals and how they're all culturally different and how they deal with things at home so that they felt secure with us because we were their family during that time and still going with COVID we're still dealing with that where make it's a little bit easier with maybe one family member we have iPads now so they can visually see their family but in the beginning it was a very like hard struggle and you really had to hone in on all your skills and how to properly care for someone that was not like you so that they could feel comfortable because you weren't like them and you wanted to understand their needs and wants. So I would say like a, that, that past year and coming into this year did, you did have to tap into a lot of things that you reviewed and learned during uh, your nursing uh, school times. Um, excellent. And so as part of that, I know one of the things that may seem very simple in nature um, but is extremely important to us is our care for skin and hair. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I, I currently work at Freighter and I float to different ICUs. Um, they're more specialized. And one of the main areas that I would float is the cardiac ICU. There they do a procedure called ECMO and we use it a lot with our COVID patients. And they lay there because they have these large um, bore uh, catheters that are coming out of their neck or their chest. So we are supporting their lungs and heart during that time while they're trying to recover. So a lot of times we can't really have them move. Sometimes we have to paralyze them so they don't move because we want to be able to properly oxygenate them with this machine that we're using. And when it came to skin and hair, I found myself educating so many different nurses um, 
on how to care for at least African Americans hair and skin because they would not know what to do. So when they would come in, they, I would come in, they would say like, can you come into my patient's room when you have time? My patient's hair is starting to like fall out and I don't know what's wrong. And then it was me observing like the room and the products they had in the room and then asking questions. And a lot of times I would hear that they were using the shampoo that we had um, access to at the hospital. And I had to educate them and explain that that is not, well, that's not good for African-Americans hair because there's a lot of alcohol in there. It's a two, um, I don't know if you, if you, I'm pretty sure everybody's heard of it, but like those body wash slash like shampoos, those are not very good for our hair. So I had to educate them that, you know, you have to use like some of the petroleum jellies that they had there or, um, or oils, or you had to reach out to the family and ask for some of the product that that patient used so that they could take care of their hair. And, and at times, if they knew that they would have multiple people coming in uh, as far as nurses caring for this patient, sometimes I, they would request that uh, they would request for me to come to the float to that floor because they would get the patient's uh, products from home from the family and I would wash their hair, condition it, and then I would braid it back for them so that their hair would be uh, protected is what we would call it a protective style. I put their hair in a protective style with braids in their hair so that during their time that they're ill and laying in bed, when they wake up, they wouldn't have to sacrifice having to maybe cut most of their hair off because of the damage of laying and not proper care. And again, while it seems like a simple thing, uh, many people don't necessarily know that. And so I applaud your efforts in not only um, having a basic understanding of the different hair textures and therefore uh, a different uh, product needs perhaps, but also then sharing that information with others. That's important. Um, we have others who've been viewing uh, the program today that want to ask some questions. So I'd like to turn it over to our viewers to have uh, their opportunity to ask Jimmy some questions today. You don't know what you don't know. So how do you ask someone about how to take care of them in an appropriate way? It, I would say there's no difference in having curiosity about anything. If you have a curiosity about a food someone's eating, there's a tactful way for you to ask them about their food and why they eat it, where it comes from. There's, there's a tactful way to do that. And so I would say if you feel like when you're inter when you're encountering someone that you are unfamiliar with and there's a question in your head there's a tactful way to just simply ask you can ask someone maybe who is not of that culture they you can't assume that just because that person is not that culture they're not culturally uh, competent you could ask someone who is near you and if they're unaware of themselves then reach out to someone who may be um, part of that culture and just politely ask say i feel like i um whatever words I feel appropriate to, ignorant or I'm unexperienced to this culture and I want to properly care for this patient. So I would want to ask you if, if you feel comfortable, you know, at, about this cult, you know, about your culture and the questions I may have so I can properly care for my patient. I would not, I and I feel anyone of any culture that you would approach would not be upset if you properly ask them. I think it's, what I see in today and society in general of all things, a lot of times it's not what you say, it's how you say it to someone. And I think that's where uh, a lot of times people feel offended is because it's the approach the person has when they're asking a question. If you're actually sincerely coming and asking a question to care for a patient, I have no doubt in my mind that the person would not be upset and would be happy to educate you on how to properly care for that patient. Thank you very much. Next question. How do you deal with a patient that does not speak English as their first language or with someone where there are language barriers? That is something that's always going to happen. I encounter that all the time. I have patients that are definitely different than who I am and do not speak the same language as I do. So if I'm unable to encounter a family member that is near on assistance, seek where you're working to see the options first because 
everywhere there is healthcare, there should be someone that is an interpreter or some type of um, program or where I currently work, we have like a video chat. So it's almost like, um, like a Zoom and you zoom in and speak to an interpreter. Uh, if you are unable to achieve any of those, I would find out what their specific language is. And then what I have done in the past, uh, per se, like uh, for Hispanics, I do not speak Spanish well. I took classes, but I am not fluent. So what I've done is, is I looked at common commands that we use when we're assessing a patient by asking basic questions like, can you tell me your name? Or can you squeeze my hands? Or can you tell me where you are? Things that we ask when we're doing an assessment I would type up an entire assessment that I would do for my patients, and then I would find a way to uh, translate it online, and then I would print that out for myself. So then I would bring it in and put it on my computer. So when I would approach the patient, I would try my best. And I will say, even though I may not pronounce all the words correctly, I have yet to encounter a situation where a patient uh, did not know what I was trying to ask, and when they were able to speak, because most of the time my patients are intubated, um, a lot of them would say once they were extubated, uh, they appreciated that I tried, you know, when the family come in or our interpreter will come in and say they appreciated that I tried to speak to them and, and their language. So I would just try. There's some language I'm pretty sure you can Google all you want and you will not be able to pronounce but I would still look for your resources because that is your best bet because I know in healthcare, it is a requirement for us to give that respect to an individual to seek and find our resources to assist them in allowing them to have some type of interpretation so that they can feel comfortable and fully understand what we're asking and doing to them. Jamise, you have been a pleasure to speak with today and what a shining example you are um, of the graduates uh, from Herzing University. I want to thank you so much for your time today. Um, and I know everyone who's viewing today feels the same way. Great information. Sometimes the simplest things can mean so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. In addition to provider education and training, changing clinical environments can also be the key to improving culturally competent care. Changes in provider knowledge, attitudes, and skills are definitely necessary, but for those gains to translate into culturally competent behaviors, the structures and culture of healthcare systems and organizations must also change. We encourage all of you in healthcare to learn more, do more, but get involved in changing the system for everyone. That's our truth, and that's our show for today. Be well, and see you next time.